All right, in the last portion of today's lecture, I'll go through some tips and tricks for implementing Q-learning algorithms, which might be useful for homework three. And then I'll give a few examples of papers that have used variants of the methods that I described in this lecture. So first, a few practical tips. Q-learning methods are generally quite a bit more finicky to use than policy gradient methods, so they tend to require a little bit more care to use correctly. It takes some care to stabilize Q-learning algorithms. And uh, what I would recommend is to start off by testing your algorithms on some easy, reliable problems where you know that your algorithm should work, just to make sure your implementation is correct. Uh, because essentially you have to go through several different phases of troubleshooting. You first have to make sure that you have no bugs, then you have to make sure that you tune your hyperparameters, and then get it to work on your real problems. So you want to do the debugging before the hyperparameter tuning, which means that you want to do it on really easy problems where basically any correct implementation should really work. Q-learning performs very differently on different problems. Uh, so these are some uh, plots of uh, uh, DQN type experiments on a variety of different Atari games. And something you might notice is that there's a huge difference in the stability of these methods. So for Pong, your reward basically uh, steadily goes up and then uh, flatlines. For Breakout, it kind of goes up and then wiggles a whole bunch. And then for some of the harder games like Video Pinball and Venture, it's just completely all over the place. And the different colored lines here simply represent different runs of the same exact algorithm with different random seeds. You can see the different random seeds for Pong are basically identical. For Breakout, they're kind of qualitatively the same but have different noise, whereas for something like Venture, some of the runs work and some fail completely. Large replay buffers do tend to help to improve stability quite a lot, so using a replay buffer of a size of about 1 million can be a pretty good choice. Uh, and at that point, the algorithm really starts looking a lot more like fit a Q iteration, which is perhaps part of the explanation for its improved stability. Uh, and lastly, Q learning takes a lot of time, so be patient. Uh, it might be no better than random for a long time while that random exploration finds the good transitions, and then it might take off once those good transitions are found. And many of you will probably experience this at homework three when you train on the Palm video game. Start with high exploration, start with large values of epsilon, and then gradually reduce exploration as you go, because initially your Q function is garbage anyway, so it's mostly the random exploration that will be doing most of the heavy lifting. And then later on, once your Q function gets better, then you can decrease epsilon. So it often helps to put it on a schedule. A few more advanced tips for Q learning. The errors of the Bellman uh, uh, error, so the, the gradients of the Bellman error can be very big. Uh, so it, it's kind of a least squares regression, so these squared error quantities can be large quantities, which means their gradients can be very large. And something that's a little troublesome is that if you have a really bad action, you don't really care about the value of that action, but your squared error objective really cares about figuring out exactly how bad it is. So if you have some good actions that are like plus 10, plus 9, plus 8, and you have some bad actions that are minus 1 million, that minus 1 million will create a huge gradient, even though you don't really care that it's minus 1 million. Like if you were guess, to guess minus 900,000, it would, be, it would result in the same policy. But your Q-function objective really cares about that. And that will result in big gradients. So what you can do is you can either clip your gradients, or you can use what's called a Huber loss. A Huber loss you can think of as kind of interpolating between a squared error loss and an absolute value loss. So far away from the, uh, from the minimum, the Huber loss looks like absolute value, and close to the minimum, because absolute value is a non-differentiable cusp, the Huber loss actually flattens it out with a quadratic. Uh, so the, uh, the green uh, curve here on the right shows a Huber loss, whereas the blue curve shows a quadratic loss. So the Huber loss actually mechanically behaves very similarly to clipping gradients, but it can be a little easier to implement. Uh, double Q-learning helps a lot in practice. It's very simple to implement, and it basically has no downsides. So probably a good idea to use double Q-learning. Uh, N-step returns can help a lot, especially in the early stages of training, but they do have some downsides because N-step returns will systematically bias your objective, especially for larger values of N. So be careful with N-step returns, but do keep in mind that they can improve things in the early stages of training. Uh, schedule exploration and schedule learning rates. Adaptive optimization rules like Adam can also help a lot. So uh, some of the older work used things like our RMS prop, which doesn't work quite as well as the most recent adaptive optimizers like Adam. So good idea to use Adam. Uh, and also, when debugging your algorithm, make sure to run multiple random seeds, because you'll see a lot of variation between random seeds. 
uh, you'll see that the algorithm is very inconsistent between runs. So you should run a few different random seeds to make sure that things are really working the way you expect and that you didn't get a fluke. And the fluke can either be unusually bad or unusually good. So keep that in mind. Okay, so in the last portion of the lecture, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a few examples of previous papers that have used algorithms that relate to the ones that I covered in this lecture. The first paper that I want to briefly talk about is this paper called Autonomous Reinforcement Learning from Raw Visual Data by Lange and Reedmiller, uh, or Lang and Reedmiller rather. Uh, so this is a paper from 2012. It's quite an old paper. And uh, it's one of the actually earliest papers that used deep learning with fit acute iteration methods. The particular procedure that this paper used, though, is a little different from the methods that we covered in this lecture. It's actually more similar to some of the model-based algorithms that I'll discuss later. So in this paper, what the authors did is they actually learn a kind of a latent space representation of images by using an autoencoder. And then they actually run fit acute iteration on the latent space of this autoencoder on the feature space. But the particular fit acute iteration they use actually doesn't use neural networks. It uses something called uh, random trees. So they use a, a non-deep but still fit acute duration procedure on the, a representation learned by a deep neural network. So it's Q-learning on top of a latent space learned with an autoencoder using fit acute duration uh, and uh, something called extra random trees for function approximation. Um, you can think of extra random trees as basically very similar to random forests. And the demonstration that they had in this paper, which is pretty cool, is to use an overhead camera to look at this little uh, slot car racetrack and then learn to control the slot car to drive around the racetrack. Here is a paper that uses convolutional neural networks with uh, Q-learning. This is deep Q-learning. Uh, so this is a paper called Human Level Control Through Deep, deep RL. And this paper uses Q-learning with convnets, uh, with replay buffers and target networks, and this kind of uh, simple one-step backup that I mentioned, uh, and one gradient step, uh, to play Atari games. And this can be improved a lot. Uh, so it can be improved a lot with double Q-learning. The original method in this paper can actually also be improved a lot just by using Atom, so that alone actually gets you much, much better performance. Um, but uh, for homework three, you'll be implementing something uh, you know, fairly similar to this paper. Here is a paper on Q-learning with continuous actions for a robotic control application, uh, or kind of a simulated control application. So this is the, uh, the, the DDPG paper called Continuous Control with Deep Reinforcement Learning. Use the continuous actions with a maximizer network and uses a replay buffer and target networks with poly averaging with a one step backup and one gradient step per simulation step. And they evaluate it on some kind of simple toy, uh, low dimensional uh, simulated robotics tasks. Uh, here's a paper that actually uses a deep Q learning algorithm with continuous actions for real world robotic control. Uh, and this actually kind of exploits some of the parallelism ideas that I discussed before. So here you have uh, multiple robots learning in parallel to open doors. It's a paper called Robotic Manipulation with Deep Reinforcement Learning and Asynchronous Off-Policy Updates. And this uses that uh, NAF representation. So this is a Q function that is quadratic in the actions, making maximization easier. You use a replay buffer and target network, a one-step backup. And this one actually uses four gradient steps per simulation step to improve the efficiency because uh, Collecting data from the robots, I guess it's not even simulation, it's actually real world. Uh, collecting data from the robots is expensive, so you'd like to do as much computation with as little data as possible. And it's further parallelized across multiple robots for better efficiency. Uh, this method, which I showed actually in lecture one, is also a deep Q learning algorithm that takes this uh, parallelized uh, interpretation of fit acute duration to the extreme. So here there are multiple robots that are learning grasping all in parallel and there are actually multiple workers that are all computing target values, multiple workers that are all performing regression, uh, and a separate worker that is managing the replay buffer. So this is literally instantiating that system that I showed before with process one, process two, and process three. And in this case, each of those processes are themselves forked off into multiple different workers on a large uh, server farm. All right. If you want to learn more about Q-learning, some suggested readings, classical papers. This is the Watkins Q-learning paper that introduced the Q-learning algorithm in 1989. This paper called Neural Fit Acute Duration uh, introduces batch mode Q-learning with neural networks. Some deep RL papers for Q-learning, the Lang and Reedmiller paper that I mentioned before, uh, the uh, DQN paper. This is the paper that introduced double Q-learning. 
This is the paper that introduced that approximate maximization with mu theta. This is the paper that introduced NAF. Uh, this is a paper that introduces something called dueling network architectures, which is very, very similar to the uh, NAF architecture, uh, but adapted for discrete action spaces. I didn't cover this in the lecture, but it's also a pretty useful trick for making Q-learning work better. Uh, all right, so these are the suggested readings, and you can find them in the slides if you want to learn more. I highly encourage you to check it out. And just to recap what we've covered in today's lecture, we talked about Q-learning in practice, how we can use replay buffers and target networks to stabilize it. We talked about ge a generalized view of fit Q iteration in terms of three processes. We talked about how double Q-learning can make Q-learning algorithms work a lot better, how we can do multi-step Q-learning, how we can do Q-learning with continuous actions, uh, including with random sampling, analytic optimization, and a second actor network. And uh, that's it.